So this is part two of our notes, obviously. Um, part one was on plate tectonics and seafloor spreading, if you remember that. Hopefully you've read over those notes. And part two, here we go. Weathering, erosion, and sedimentation as far as they apply to the ocean. Because all of these things make the ocean what it is. All of this stuff that's weathered and then eroded into the ocean has made the ocean saltier and saltier over the last, you know, hundreds of millions of years to make it to the saltiness that it is now. And it's only going to get saltier. It's not going to get fresher. Now, yes, if we go through a warming period and all of the ice melts on the surface of the planet and, you know, fills the ocean, the ocean levels will rise, sort of, a little bit not like the whole planet, um, and it will become a little less salty, but the process will still continue to happen. Waves will wash on the shore and wash stuff on the land into the water and make it saltier, okay? So that's why this is important. So now we're kind of combining the last unit with the next level. And then after this, of course, we're gonna go into, after this unit, we're gonna go into living things, all right? So the first uh, point we have to cover is distinguishing between weathering and erosion. What are the difference between those two things? And we'll hit on sedimentation later. So weathering is the breaking down of rocks and sediment into small fragments. Weathering is breaking down. Rock that is weathered looks like this. Okay, this is me um, at uh, Blowing Rocks Preserve in Jupiter, on Jupiter Island just um, a couple weeks ago, okay? And it's really fun place to go. It's the only place on in Florida that has natural rocky shore. It's a very small stretch. You can walk the whole thing in a few minutes, um, 10 minutes maybe. Well, actually I take that back. This part, 10 minutes, but then further, it continues to go farther to uh, a place called Coral Cove, and then to Jupiter Inlet. Um, so it's north of Jupiter Inlet, where the, light, where the lighthouse is, okay? And then erosion, so, so worn down rock is weathered, but where, is the pe where do the pieces go after they're worn down? That's the question. They get transported someplace else, and that is erosion. So the difference between these two seems very basic, but students like you mess it up all the time, so please don't. Weathering is breaking down and erosion is carrying away, okay? And that's what happened here. This sand eroded after a hurricane, got carried away, which made the houses sink, okay? So there's different kinds of weathering. We're gonna start with weathering and talk about that first. Here's another picture uh, um, of um, Blowing Rocks Preserve. These are called pipes, and um, they're a combination of the chemical and mechanical weathering that, or mechanical or physical weathering, that's the same thing, mechanical and physical. Um, and at high tide, when the water, when the waves come in, they wash up underneath and they shoot out of these like geysers. So you have to plan your trip at high tide and you will see this happening at the beach, just like you've seen in like videos where people get like washed off of the rocks and things. That happens right here in Florida. Just, it's only 40 minutes, not even north of here. So next weekend, you wanna to go to the beach, go to this beach and you can, snorkel there um it's just a really amazing place to go blowing rocks so chemical weathering is when things like acids like carbonic acid that we talked about in the last unit when carbon dioxide gets dissolved into the water it turns slightly acidic not the carbon dioxide it goes through a chemical reaction that turns it into carbon carbonic acid um, and that water will break down limestone rocks like these, as well as shells, and even the, the skeletons of corals and algae, which is obviously a big problem for the eco those ecosystems. And then physical weathering is simply just breaking the rocks into smaller pieces. Um, so waves and currents, wind, 
um, will make one thing hit another, and that is a physical change, not a chemical change, okay? And so sand, it's abrasive. That's why they make paper out of sand to, you know, create friction to make wood smooth, sandpaper. And um, you can also sandblast things. It's very coarse, very abrasive, um, and that's physical weathering. And then there's organic weathering. And I, I, I just love this animation because it shows a fish pooping. But it's not just regular poop. These are parrotfish, okay? Parrotfish eat coral and other types of organisms like that, and they ingest the um, calcium carbonate. So they are weathering down, they're breaking down the, the organic rocks, and they are themselves organic, okay, organically produced rocks, I should say. There's no organic rocks, there's no living rock. Um, they do sell something in the fish store called live rock, but the rock itself is not alive. It, it, the rock is, has things living in it, like little worms and snails and bacteria and things like that. And they use those to start fish tanks up. Um, so these animals, and as well as burrowing animals and other animals that eat corals, um, will break the rock down. And in this, what you're seeing here is uh, two different species, but one of them is biting the coral, right? Biting the surface. And the other one is pooping out sand pure white sand, um, which is pretty amazing. So, pretty amazing creatures. We're gonna learn about them. They also do some other neat stuff at night. They go to sleep and they make a cocoon around themselves out of mucus every single night, just protect themselves. These unique creatures. So, um, what are the four main types of erosion? So we talked about three types of weathering, chemical, physical, organic, and now we're gonna talk about different types of carrying those weathered particles away, all right? So ice is the first one. Um, it's kind of my favorite. I know we don't have a lot of that down here, but where I am from, Long Island, New York, um, which is right outside of Manhattan, it's called Long Island because it's a 120 mile long island, <laughs> um, is made by glaciers, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So. This is a time frame, obviously, showing glacial movement down a valley. It's actually cutting the valley, cutting the mountains away to make a, what's called a U-shaped valley. So as they move, as the ice moves, it carves away rock and carries it with it. The carving part is the weather. The, the moving it forward is the erosion, okay? So it kind of does both things. And they create fjords, which I'll show you, um, and islands, like where I'm from, Long Island. And they deposit new sediment and new locations as the glacier moves. So here's the formation of Long Island. So here's what happened. So let's, uh, the glacier, let's start this from the beginning, okay? The glacier has all this stuff that it's pushed forward and cut out. And when it starts to melt, it deposits the stuff that it was carrying in piles, that's called deposition. So it, it, it does all three, actually, glaciers. They, they weather, they erode, and then they deposit. They do all three parts of this process. And so as the glacier um, receded when the last ice age ended, like 20,000 years ago or something like that, okay, um, it dropped off all the stuff it was carrying, which made Long Island. And that's where I'm from right there. So my, my hometown would not be there if we didn't have an ice age. It's pretty cool. Florida has very similar glaciation stories. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to get into this too much, but Florida um, was once twice as wide and was also almost gone, not even here, when the, when the water rose. There were just some islands in the middle of Florida. Okay, so the other three ways that uh, erosion can happen are by water, wind, and gravity. So ice, water, wind, and gravity. Water, obviously, you've seen water carry sand away at the beach. That's pretty simple. Um, it's just moving 
water comes in, storms come in, not even, just a regular high tide will, will wash sand, carry it away, okay? Wind, again, you ever go to the beach on a windy day, especially during winter, believe it or not, I like the beach at winter. Um, you can't swim, obviously, but it's just a really abandoned, unique place that has kind of a different vibe to it than, than the summertime. And um, I like it. I've been to the beach in New York lots of times when it was snowing out. It's the only place I ever saw a snowy owl. You know, like Harry Potter's owl? Um, uh, it's called a snowy owl. Only time I ever saw a snowy owl was when I went to the beach in a snowstorm. Just was sitting on a post, it was just chilling out. Drove by it in my car and stopped, it was so cool. Um, and so what I was trying to say about that, the beach in the winter particularly, but it happens in the summer too, is that the winds, it's windier and rougher. The, Beach is rougher a place in the winter. And the winds blow the dry sand because it's our dry season down here in the winter. We don't get a lot of rain. And so the beach also dries out. And that sand can, if you're wearing shorts, it'll feel like you're getting sandblasted. And it gets in your eyes and it gets in your hair and just gets everywhere. So um, wind moves sediment. And then of course, gravity, right? Gravity is going to affect everything that gets loosed from its original place. So um, its particles are gonna be dragged down to lower depths due to gravity, sinking, falling down the seafloor, something called a submarine landslide. Let's take a look. So here's what I was talking about with the wind, okay? So you can just imagine going to the beach on a winter day, it's kind of cloudy, you know, it's not raining though, and it's cold and it's rough and you definitely don't want to go in the water unless you have like a, a wetsuit. Maybe if some of you surf, maybe you know what I'm talking about uh, or dive even. Um, and then the, the wind is just whipping that sand around. You can just imagine how that would feel. Some of you probably felt it before. And then of course, these are um, landslides. I mean, check it out, this is crazy. I don't know how this person caught this on video, but um, both of these, the whole entire side of that just goes into the, into the ocean. And of course that is weathered rock that is now moving due to gravity that therefore is erosion. Movement is erosion. And then it gets into the ocean and God knows where it's gonna go. It's gonna go everywhere, right? And it brings nutrients into the water for the fish and other things, but could also cover and bury coral reefs. So that's bad. So it has pluses and minuses. And then here, this is just, you've probably been watching this one more than that one, because it's always interesting what people are gonna do. But the whole side of that cliff just like falls down in the water and it makes this giant wave that washes up everywhere. It falls right in the water, hits the water, and this is just, this, it's hard to see, but you can see the water rising up at their feet and they're running away from the wave. So that was wild. I don't know how they got that video, just by chance. And then this is not playing. Okay, uh, no. Oh, it did play. Okay, this is, this is sick. This was in uh, Scandinavia, Denmark, or something like that, just like a year ago or so. The entire part of the town just landslided down into the, this body of water here. And all these houses just lost, just gone. It's just incredible. think anybody was home they kind of knew what was happening and they all like got out of there but I mean this is just as bad as a tsunami as bad as a you know a tidal wave the whole thing look where it used to be it used to be right up there and it just all fell down eroded into the sea and that's salt water not fresh water And then this was um, in LA County, in California. They didn't get a video of it, but they got photographs of the whole thing starting to slide and then what it ended up at the end. So this is a highway. This is a very famous highway called the Pacific 
A1A or something like that highway. Um, and this just decided I'm going to go and it started to go and gone. So they, since, I think since then, this was, um, two, uh, this was four years ago. So since then, I think they've actually come through here with all their machinery and uh, they fixed the road. But um, pretty scary, especially if you like lived over here and you needed to get over there and now you're not. Now you have to drive all the way around the mountains or something. I don't know how they did it, but pretty, that's wild. These are all just amazing. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the deposition part. So we've covered the weathering part, we've covered the erosion part, and now we're talking about depositing those eroded particles. Where do they go? They break up, they get carried away, and they get dumped somewhere, okay? So this is sedimentation, is deposition leading to a buildup of sediment. And so you see it when you see this something called a sand spit. Yeah, like spit, yeah. That's called a sand spit. We have them all over Florida. Um, along the barrier beach islands that exist right here um, in Boca. They look like this as well. You'd see how this is spread out like it was flowing or got pushed by water okay, and deposited from over here to over here. Here this diagram is showing this what's called a deep sea fan because um, it, as it slides, as water or perhaps denser water pours over this underwater cliff, it um, takes sediment with it and erodes it and then dumps it kind of out in a fan shape. And you can see the same similar here. This is a river carrying sediment into the ocean and then depositing it either on the beaches or further out into the water. So that's sedimentation. So we're on slide 13 right now. So understand how the speed of water flow and particle size affect the removal, transport, and deposition of particles. So you have a uh, chart like this. You have to fill in the missing parts. So we're going from something very fine. If I had dry silt in my hand, I could just go and it would look like powder. So it's very, very fine. Um, and it gets carried the farthest away. So it's sedimentation rate rate of being deposited is going to be very low or slow because it's very light and it My gets phone's not working. Are you there? it gets carried farther away. Yes, Mrs. Keen, I'm currently recording notes and you're on video. Say hello. Hello, children. I'll be done in a little while. Okay, bye. Okay, so uh, fine sand, medium, so that will get carried away, but you know, not as far. It'll start to fall sooner. Of course, coarse sand, if you threw a handful of sand in the water, it's just gonna sink right to the bottom. And then um, gravel and small stones, you're really not gonna get much uh, deposition of those. They're pretty much gonna stay where they are until they break up more, until they weather more and become coarse and fine sand and even silt. And you're only really going to get movement if, it, if you have a hurricane or like a tsunami washes them away or you know, hurricane, big waves and lots of them over and over and over again. Um, see, so here is an example of a rocky beach. Um, not like the one we have in Florida. I showed you what that one looks like. And I think I'll show you that again later. But um, these pebbles, these, these rocks won't go anywhere. But you can see as you get further away, the size decreases in this way. So um, these particles will get carried farther out, all right? They require more energy. And I pretty much just described all this when I was talking about that, okay? And hopefully you filled this in uh, while I was talking. If not, get it from somebody else or come, or come back later. Okay, hey! I know that guy, that's me again. So the first picture I showed you of blowing rock was way over there. So that's where the rocks get really big and that's where when the tide comes in, you're gonna see those like geysers of water shooting out. And these are people fishing and, and snorkeling out here. And these rocks, this is low tide. This was like almost dead low. So these rocks right here go all the way almost to uh, the lighthouse in Jupiter. And that picture on the bottom is not from here. Um, 
But this is called the littoral zone. Lit oral, littoral. Don't pronounce it literal because you know that is a different word. L no one pronounces that literal. It's littoral zone. And this is the what's called the intertidal zone, the intertidal region. It is the point between the lowest low tide and the highest high tide. And critters live here, okay? All sorts of critters that don't necessarily live in the deeper parts, okay? So the littoral zone encompasses the highest highs and the lowest lows, but not the, you know, the normal water zones. It actually cuts off there. So this is open water, the photic, and this is the aphotic down here, okay. And so you could have rocky beaches that have littoral zones. You could have sandy beaches that have littoral zones. <clears throat> the distance between the high and low, that, that region. Um, examples of littoral zones, including rocky shores. Here's a rocky shore, get it? <laughs> awesome. Okay, and there's a sandy shore. Right there, okay. Um, estuaries. There are sharks in estuaries. Estuaries, we'll talk more about this in the future, um, but I wrote a book and it's being published this week. I just got an email today from my publisher, my other publisher, I have two publishers. Um, this book is uh, about me growing up on the south shore of Long Island and um, it's, a, it's a memoir. It's, it's funny. <laughs> um, and so this, we had a house. We didn't live there. It was like a vacation kind of house, like a cabin in the woods, but instead of the woods, on the salt marshes, on stilts, you know, we would go there all, all the time as kids. It's still up there. My family still uh, owns it. But um, muddy littoral zones. I'll show you. We'll talk more about those. We're going to talk all about the, these creatures that live in these different zones too. Okay? And, of course, something called a delta. Um, typically... A river delta, but I'm going to talk about each one of these right now, okay? And yes, there are sharks in estuaries, like I said. <clears throat> sharks in all these places. So here are the rock. Here's a rocky shore, okay? I took that picture right there at Blowing Rock, okay? Because I thought that was really neat. This thing looked big. It's only like this tall. <laughs> it's only like that tall. And it was low tide, and there are tidal pools in here. Fish were swimming around. Um, I didn't have much time. We were just hiking, so I didn't have much time to like stop and sit and like you know play around with the stuff in the tidal pool. But there were these creatures. These are called polyplacophora. Poly means many plaques. One, two, three, four, five, six polyplac, many plaques. Okay, and these are called limpet shells. They grow in there as well. Those these things were all over at Blowing Rocks. Things that these, these wouldn't live anywhere else except on in the littoral zone of a rocky shore. And where's the only rocky shore in Florida? Right there, right here. Just 30 minutes north of here, 40 minutes north of here. It's pretty cool. So we've got the, uh, the waves, you know, constantly beating on the rocks and um, there's little erosion because there's a little bit more with limestone because limestone is susceptible to that carbonic acid that we were talking about. Um, very little sedimentation. Why? Because the larger particles, larger particles don't get, to, you know, moved very much, so they don't get deposited very much. Um, and like we said, tide pools um, and lots of places for critters to hide in the rock, little nooks and crannies. Um, here's a, another example of rocky shore. So there are different kinds of structures um, that are created. You've seen these in movies and videos and, and you know, everywhere. Maybe you've actually been to some of these. If you've been up north to Maine in New England or on the West Coast, and maybe even down in the Caribbean. So these are called stacks and arches. Um, and they get four, we don't have to know all the different steps here. I was just putting this up here to show you that there are, you know, you start with a crack 
And this is, you know, we're talking thousands of years, right, of constant waves and wind banging on this. And eventually it, it, it turns into something like an arch, and then the middle of the arch collapses, and then you get these stacks. And then eventually it gets so eroded that one day it just gonna go, it's going to be under the water. Okay? And this is an example of one that recently, just this year, in, in the spring, um, in the Galapagos Islands, that was an arch turned into two stacks because the, the, the center of the arch had fallen. And it's called Darwin's Arch because um, he was the first one to like document its existence over a hundred years ago, okay? Back in the 1800s when he made his journey, his voyage on the HMS Beagle, which is a ship, to the Galapagos Islands and um, yeah. So that's it. <laughs> that's just a modern day example of before and after. And then these things called marine terraces. So you've got the, the waves will cut shelves into the coastline and they're called terraces and they're called marine terraces because they happen at the edge of the ocean, not at an edge of a lake or something like that, or not up here um, outside of the ocean. So at one time the sea level was higher and it made this, ter this terrace here, but then the sea level lowered because we had went through a colder period and more ice, which pulled water out of the ocean to lock up into the polar ice caps, which lowered down here. And now this one had, was, has been cut away. So it's multi-tiers of terraces here as well. So here you have a great big one where the, where the water used to be hitting there, but then the level dropped and now it's making a new terrace here, okay? So marine terraces. And then sandy shores. This is one of my favorite creatures. We're gonna learn more about these in the future. That is Limulus polyphemus or the horseshoe crab. And there are several different species of horseshoe crab, but this is the one that we have here in Florida. Um, you're typically not going to find them uh, at the beach, beach, beach. You probably more find them in the intracoastal areas and the uh, estuaries and places like that because um, it's a little too rough for them on the beach, beach proper with the big waves. Um, and of course, sandy shores typically have smaller waves because they have a gradual slope, not a steep slope. Um, the sediment is constantly shifting because there's not much energy needed to move those small particles. Waves and currents and tides erode that sediment. And I, like I said, more so in the winter months. And um, waves and currents and tides and wind, wind deposit sediment. That is supposed to say winter. What a horrible typo. That's supposed to say winter. So please on your notes, fix that right there to say winter, okay? And then, um, so we've got erosion more and deposition more, okay, in the winter. And then of course, animals burrow here. Something called in fauna, which again, we're gonna learn more about in the future, but just as an introduction. Um, in fauna, fauna means uh, animals. Flora means plants. So the fauna and flora of an area are the animals and plants. Um, in fauna is animals that live in the ground, okay? And those are burrowing animals that live. And you can, if you've ever fished, like at the beach, you should know that when the wave comes in, and washes back out again, you'll see little bubbles coming up out of little holes. Those are crabs, called mole crabs. Some people call them sand fleas. They're not fleas, and they don't bite. Um, they're little crabs that are adapted to burrowing into the sand, and you can use them for bait. They make really good bait for catching, for surf fishing. Muddy shores. Um, they're somewhat protected from the waves. They usually occur more inland. Um, very little weathering and erosion. They formed by the deposit of sediment, especially fine sediment, very, very silty particles. If you walked out here, you'd probably sink, like first your ankles and then your knees, 
and then possibly even your hips. In my book that I just told you about, I actually have a couple of stories about people sinking and like almost dying uh, because the mud is so treacherous in these muddy areas, okay? Very low oxygen levels in, the, um, in these pools and things, and it's smelly um, because there's a lot of um, decomposition, so it smells sometimes like at low tide. Have you ever smelled low tide like in the mangroves? Um, it smells like rotten eggs. Okay, you're going to get some of that. And you got a lot of animals burrowing here. This is where you're going to find your clams and your scallops. And um, there's really good fishing in these areas as well. When the tide comes up, of course, I would not be walking out there. Very gradual slope. And they're called mud flats. And then finally, we have deltas. There's two more slides after this. Delta is, deltas are where rivers flow out into the ocean. And they deposit all of the, what they're carrying as soon as it hits that open water and it sediments, sedimentation out, causing these what are called alluvial fans in some places. They're called, that's more about when it's running down a mountainside, but they're fan shaped. Let's just put it that way, okay? And they, because they fan out almost like the veins in a uh, of an organism, you know, like, or the veins in a leaf of a tree, kind of, you know, kind of like that. Fingers, almost. And so you may have heard of the Mississippi River Delta or the Mekong River Delta in uh, Vietnam or um, the Amazon or Nile River Deltas. And then estuaries. Estuaries is the last one. These are your sheltered bodies of water, and the key here is, if, you know, if you, the key thing about an estuary you have to know is that it is where fresh water mixes with salt water. That, that is the first part of every definition of, uh, of an estuary, is where fresh and salt water mix, creating something called brackish water. Not quite as salty as the sea, but not as fresh as a lake, okay? Somewhere in between. You would taste it and still say, too salty. You know, you didn't want to drink that. So, but it still has a lower salinity than the ocean proper. Again, they're sheltered from erosion and waves, so they get a lot of fine sand and silt building up in there. They can have a high turbidity. Turbid water is cloudy. There's lots of things I know we shouldn't use the word things in science, but we're explaining what they are right now. We'll just confuse you. We'll get to the things later, okay? Um, little particles of stuff that it's carrying, including living things. Uh, let's just go there, okay? They're also called, also known as lagoons, bays, sounds, and uh, sloughs or sloths. How do you pronounce that word? Sloth? Slough? I don't know. Um, I never use it, so you don't have to know it either. Then there's something called a drowned river valley, all right? A fjord, a bar built, and a tectonic estuary. Most of the estuaries, or virtually all of the estuaries in Florida, I think, are going to be bar built. Um, because you've got this barrier islands pretty much around the whole state. And this is where I'm from on Long Island, too. We have the very same thing. And then inside, between the mainland and the barrier beach islands, you've got the inlet, like the Boca Inlet or Jupiter Inlet or the Boynton Beach Inlet, all those inlets. Um, and then you've got this body of water inside, and that's where the estuary is going to be, in there. These will occur in other places where you perhaps have a river um, that um, formed the last ice age and, and the increase in water level because of the melting ice covered that river valley okay a fjord cut by glaciers so we're not going to have those here those are up in alaska or in scandinavia okay where we saw those houses falling into the water that was a fjord um, and then tectonic is when you've got tectonic activity like from the last part of the notes um, where you've got shifting plates and the shifting, the land moved out of the way, it subsided, and seawater flooded in, causing and creating an estuary where fresh water meets salt water.
Okay. And here's some pictures. Oh, so this is what a drowned river valley might look like. This is tectonic. Anybody know where that is? That is San Francisco. Okay, that's the Golden Gate Bridge. Or one of those is the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, this is right here in Boynton Beach Inlet. All those red arrows, I put those there because they're great snorkeling. I have been to all, except for that one. I haven't been to that one, but I've looked at it from the parking lot and it looks really awesome. But you really can't get to it unless you have a boat. Um, unless you're crazy enough to jump in the water because there's no way to get back out. I don't know how you get back out. But over here, there's a little beach and pretty good snorkeling for beginners. Here is okay. Um, we were at, I think, a bad tide. We were at the outgoing tides. The water was kind of cloudy, but over here is awesome. There's this pump thing here that pumps sand from one side of the, the inlet to the other. And there's a big deep hole. You can kind of see it right there, like 20 feet deep. It's crystal clear. Um, and there's all kinds of snook and all kinds of fish swimming around there. It's really, really cool. Um, but the, the water, have you ever been here? The water goes through this, like, like a raging torrent river. The only time I've ever seen water so forcefully moving was when I visited Niagara Falls uh, up in New York, uh, in Canada, the New York-Canada border. Um, was there twice and uh, I'd never seen anything like that before, but right before the water falls over the edge, this is just like that. It's crazy. And you could go on YouTube and look at the boats trying to come in the inlet and some of them sink. I have my own personal story with my sailboat about that as well. But um, that's it. That's a note. That's part two. Part three will be the following week or maybe not. Part three might be in a couple days. I think, I'm, I think a couple days because we got to finish this up. When's our test? Look on the backboard. Monday, 927. So it's right around the corner. We got to do that. So... Um, any questions, ask me. I'm right over there. And we do have a couple, little bit of extra time. So you might want to work on some of those assignments that you seem to get in from last week, including your test corrections.